welcome to the Personal Development Mastery Podcast. I'm Aggie Keramidas and my mission is to inspire you to rise up, grow, stand out and take action towards the next level of your life. I interview leaders, influencers, entrepreneurs, authors, exceptional people who can and will inspire you to improve your life. Tune in for two episodes each week and make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get the episodes as soon as they are released. This is the second half of the conversation with Jamie Keeling. If you want to listen to the previous part, tune in to the previous episode number 116. I wanted to ask you about your podcast, the Optimize Me Now. So now you have over 60 episodes there and uh, it's a brilliant podcast. So I, I endorse it myself. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you why you started the podcast. Great question. Um, I was inspired by Joe Rogan, uh, simply. I love the way that he had really honest conversations. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that for me was the main motivation is I wanted to do the same. Uh, I just love the way that he would talk about real things, talk about things that other people weren't talking about, and not be afraid to go into things that may be considered conspiracies or more esoteric subjects but be really down to earth and honest about it and not be afraid to call people out on their bullshit. Um, So for me, it was about, I want to have some real conversations, but real conversations that are meaningful to people who are listening in a way that can help them think differently about the world, their own lives, their business, and help them to get better results. Mm -hmm. And over the, I mean, when I started the podcast, it was just me talking about my experiences, my systems and strategies and that kind of stuff. Um, and the very first episode actually was with my best mate, Kevin, and it was around money mindset. And I loved that episode. And the ones that I did on my own, they they were great, but they were different. And I really loved, as I got into it and started having more and more guests coming on the show, mm-hmm. I loved the fact that Actually, these were people who, they're not Gary Vee, they're not Tony Robbins, they're not, not these big names, they're not famous like that. But actually, their stories were equally as empowering, equally as powerful, equally as inspiring. And these are just normal people. Like the people I've had on my show, the things that they've shared, the things that they've talked about, the insights. So my latest episode with Lindy Harding is a great example. Probably the most profound podcast episode I've done. And the way that she talked about her experiences of jumping out of an aeroplane, falling 5,000 feet and hitting the ground with no parachute. Oh. And the experience of the recovery and how she reconciled that event and losing her mum when she was 18 years old and just all of this stuff. But the way that she thinks about life. And she said something that almost brought me to tears on the show when she was talking about how when you've lost so much, it's important to see the beauty in the smallest things. Mm -hmm. So just see a smile in someone and appreciate how truly wonderful that is. And it's those kind of insights. I learned so much from talking to my guests. It's it's a very selfish endeavor in that sense that I get to sit down for an hour or two hours per guest and just pick their brains. And I have guests on who've got amazing stories, who've been through amazing experiences, who are experts in one area of business or social media or whatever it might be, martial artists, anybody who's got a story, who anyone who's achieved something or who I feel can share something that can make a positive difference in people's lives. I learn from that. But one of the most rewarding things is knowing that we're having an open, honest, real conversation where I'm not afraid to call bullshit or go there with things that other people might not be prepared to do and the effect that can have on people because I know what effect listening to Joe Rogan has had on me over the years I've learned so much and it's opened my eyes to so many different things it's made me a much more critical thinker and ultimately it's improved my life and I've always wanted to have that effect from a very young age I was into I remember as a kid reading the famous five books and Secret Seven series, and all this kind of stuff. I know them, yeah. And I love that stuff, man. Like, I remember when I was a kid, we had an old shed in our garden. We lived down in Norfolk at the time. And that was going to be my Secret Seven shed. I was going to start the Secret Seven. I've always had these weird and wacky ideas. But 
from a very young age, I've always wanted to make a difference. Like even when I was 12, 13 years old, I decided that I was going to be the one to build the real USS Enterprise from Star Trek. Okay. And it sounds ridiculous and crazy, right? But I was, I was actually collecting my dad's beer cans to be able to use that metal for the hull of the ship. Like I, I'd got ideas of how, I mean, it's stupid and crazy. Looking back, it was never going to work. But I'd, I just wanted to do something that was going to move us forward, that was going to create an impact, mm-hmm. that was going to help everybody grow and evolve. Yes. And I've completely forgotten the point of the question. <laughs> <laughs> the question, no, I will, you said earlier that uh, you're being selfish by uh, Other picking podcasts. people's yeah, uh, yeah. brains, but do you know what? I think you would be selfish if you would keep that information to yourself, but you're not. You're sharing it with the world. So uh, what you're doing when you're interviewing, it's similar to what I'm doing and all the people that share knowledge is being a knowledge broker. So we yes. we take someone's knowledge, uh, life's experience, uh, lessons, and we kind of distill it through our own lens or through what we believe that would be the most beneficial way to our listeners and give it to them as well. Of course, we benefit tremendously by the interaction and learning things firsthand, which the listener will probably not have the same kind of uh, uh, knowledge or uh, energy gained like I'm having at the moment been right opposite you. But still, the knowledge will be passed on, the impact will be made. You mentioned earlier that if we can change one person's life as a result of this, it's been a success. And I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, we're both investing time, energy and effort in doing what we do, right? With your podcast, my podcast, it takes a lot of work, you know, finding the guests, curating the content, putting, you know, look at the notes you put together for today's show. And we'll do a similar thing in terms of researching the guests. What are they about? What's their story? How can I what questions can I ask to draw out the real gold dust that's inside of this person? And that takes some energy and effort. For me, the reward is I don't get paid for my podcast, the same as you. Um, you know, I don't run ads or anything like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll promote my products and services. Mm-hmm. I'll talk about my Bulletproof Business Accelerator programs and, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I do it just to give, to give back and so I can learn and so that hopefully I can just show people that there is another side to life. There is another point of view. There's another way to look at this in the hope that that can expand their thinking and in turn, give them better results in whatever it is that they're doing. Um, so I, I get a lot out of it personally, but the most that I get out of it is seeing the result. I, I love seeing other people succeed. I love when you have that conversation, and that's why coaching I'm so passionate about is when you can have a conversation with somebody and help them to turn on a light switch in their brains, help them to think differently, think in a way that they've not thought before. And you, you see that light bulb moment come on. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, that man, that's what it's all about that for gives me. gives you, yeah, the, the, the satisfaction, the fulfillment <clears throat> that you have helped. Yes, yeah. but just, just, just to see that other person light up. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. And like, I suppose for me as well, if I can do that, for my clients, if I can do that for the people who follow me on social media, then I stand a better chance of being able to do that for my kids. And that's a big motivation for me. Um, One of my favorite things about the way I put out content and the fact that my content is out there and so much of it, one of the, my favorite things about that is that it's always going to be there. And if I die tomorrow, my kids are always going to have my lessons. They'll always have that. They'll always, I can go on my Facebook profile and they can see me talking about business, about life, about relationships, about mental attitude, about all of this stuff. And, and I can rest a little easier knowing that even if something does happen to me, my kids can still learn from me and they can still see my leading with a positive example. And my, my kids are a massive inspiration for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I want, I don't want to be the father who, tells the the kids you can do anything you can do this you can do that whilst not leading by example yeah yeah you can do anything but make sure you go to college and do maths and get a safe job Uh, no Uh, if if I, i want my kids to be the very best that they can be i want them to grow and whatever they choose to do i'm not going to force anything on them but i want to give them the tools so that whatever they do can serve them and can serve the people around them now 
They might only choose to be great people in their close family and friend circle. They may choose to be an influencer and go on and help millions. Either's cool with me. Um, but I want them to have the option. I want them to have the tools. And I want them to look at their dad and say, do you know what? Anything that I want, anything that I, whoever I want to be, whatever I want to achieve, so long as I put the work in, I can do it. Mm-hmm. And you know how I know that? Because my dad fucking did it. He showed me. He started here and he got to there and he did it with hard work, learning, determination, and just getting after it with tenacity, being resilient. And he showed me how to be in order to get all of the things that I want, how to serve myself and serve others. Mm -hmm. And for me, seeing my kids grow into adults and go out into the world with that philosophy, that, that would be a successful life for me. To see that... I would die a very happy man. It, I feel uh, in a similar way that the podcast is a kind of a legacy that is been left behind uh, after us. Even if we're not here, the podcast will remain and the knowledge and uh, all the information will hopefully remain for a very long time. I, I think it's just important to, to have those conversations. You know, coming back to the podcast, like... The whole thing around swearing um, and various other topics, you know, it's just important we talk about it. Uh, just because I feel the way I do about swearing as an example doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. I feel strongly about it and, and I've got my reasons for that and I can articulate that. Other people disagree with me. That's cool. Absolutely. You're not right yeah. or wrong. I'm not right or wrong. We just think about it differently and that's okay. Sure. But I think that's important is to have that conversation, but to have it in an open forum so that people can make an educated decision about how they live their lives, about how they behave, about how they interact with other people. Not doing it from their own biases and their own social conditionings, because there's a lot of the time, and the same is true for me even today, a lot of the thoughts in my head are not my own, right? They come from all of the people around me, my, like so much of who we are and the patterns that run our lives come from the first seven years of our life. Mm -hmm. They come from how our parents behaved, how our parents dealt with us, the things that they said. And the more and more I delve into those patterns and those programs, the more and more I see how they were formed back when I was a little kid. And it's not until you make those connections and you understand, all right, that's where it came from. That's why I am the way I am. Now I can modulate and I can manage that and produce better results. Mm but you've got to be willing to go there. And I think people need to understand and like there's another level. There's there's deeper that you can go. There's like you're some people have said to me, "Oh, you know, you, you are you are what you are. It is what it is. You know, this is just the way I am." Uh, you know, uh, and that that point of view just drives me insane. I used it, to think like that about myself for, so did I. for a very long time. Yeah. I snapped out of it when I realized that it's not Absolutely. It change at any moment. Exactly. And I've done various different experiments that have proven that to be true. Mm-hmm. Um, you can be whoever you want to be. You just need to make a choice. But the thing that holds people back is the preconception of what people think they should be, what their family think they should be, who their friends think they should be, mm-hmm. who their colleagues think they should be. And so the trying to live in the expectations of others, well, that's not who you are there's then a massive disconnect between who you're trying to be and what you're putting out in the world and who, what you feel here, right? The, the core of yourself. Mm-hmm. That causes massive anxiety, can cause massive depression. That's a real battle and a struggle for people. But then it's like, well, I know that I should be more in tune with this, but like this is what people are expecting. If I'm more myself, then I'm going to be, you know, people aren't going to like me. They're going to think I'm this, they're going to think I'm that. Stop worrying about what other people think. What other people think of you is none of your fucking business. Like, get that out of your head right now. Who the hell are you? What are your values? Who are you in here? Mm. And just live true to that. Right, obviously, don't go around killing people and hitting people over the head with hammers and all this kind of stuff. I doubt that would, that would be in someone's values, <clears throat> really. But uh, yeah, anyway. Well, you, ne- you never know. <laughs> but the, the point is that I'm just trying to, like, there's going to be things that come up when I'm saying this stuff. I know there's things that are going to come up in people's heads. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to address the elephant in the room as I feel it's going to come up for them, right? And it doesn't mean that, like, 
you've got to, it's the way you behave and the things that you do, the things that you say, the way you interact with people. Try and move away from this whole idea around what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. Mm-hmm. Instead, ask yourself, does this serve me and the people around me? Right? And, and to serve yourself is not selfish. This is another really important point. You have to look after yourself. And we talked about this briefly last night. Is that when you were crewing for UPW on the last day, you had a bit of a line until 9.30 because they'd said to you, you're not helping anybody if you're drained and exhausted massive like but we're conditioned almost these days to think that if we focus on ourselves we're being selfish and we need to be you know it's all about other people bollocks women and um mothers in particular are this is a big problem as i see it because they're very focused on their kids Mm -hmm. it's all about what do they need what does the partner need and that's lovely that whole mindset of wanting to serve like that is wonderful but you've got to look after yourself first because if you don't, you burn out, you're pissed off, you've got a short fuse, you're not serving the people around you when you're like that. How can you give 100% of yourself or how can you give 100% to the people around you if you yourself are not at 100%? It's impossible. You can't give more than you've got. So looking after yourself first is imperative. You have to make sure that you are at your best you are at your strongest mentally and physically in order to be able to serve the people in the world, whether that's just your family, your kids, or whether that's a wider community, to the highest level. Mm-hmm. Jamie, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you something different. Um, you said earlier about coaching and mentoring. So I want to speak a little bit about your business and how you help others, other business owners to, to scale up and You said earlier that uh, you wanted to clarify the business, the the mentoring versus coaching difference, which is something that uh, I suppose many people are not uh, familiar with. So yeah, um, so there is a difference between mentoring and coaching and training um, and consulting. Mentoring is when you're going in as a mentor and telling someone what they need to do. So as a mentor going into a business, I would go in, I would say, right, what's your problem? What's your challenge? And then I would devise with them and say, right, okay, if that's your challenge, you need to do X, then Y, then Z. Yeah. Go away and do it. Um, coaching is different insofar as that it's more about getting them there on their own. Right? So not me coming in and saying, right, do X, Y, and Z. It's more about giving them the tools so that they can go and catch the fish themselves, Mm -hmm. right? Because if they learn how to do it, and if they learn how to curate their thought process Mm -hmm. to get to that result, then they can do it again and again and again. Now, that for me is where there's real value in in coaching. Mentoring, yeah, has a place. And I think as a coach or a mentor or someone in that space, you're not just a coach. You're not just a mentor. You're not just a trainer. I think to be the best in the field – and to really be effective and get great outcomes, you have to be all three. You have to train them on how to do some stuff. You have to tell them sometimes what they need to do. And you need to give them the tools to be able to replicate that and do it again themselves in the future. That, that's what makes a great coach, consultant, mentor, whatever you want to call it. And I think there's a big problem in the personal development industry today whereby there's lots of people in the space. It's a very, very sat- you know, you look at coaches and mentors, there's like life, how many life coaches are there? Like there's seven and a half billion people in the world. I'm sure there's nine billion life coaches, right? Same with business coaches. I hate calling myself a business coach because mm-hmm. there's there are 10 to a dozen. And the thing that frustrates me most about them is a lot of them, they have a coaching business. They've done a degree or qualified master coach or uh, action coach or one of these kind of uh, franchises, but don't have the prerequisite experience in business outside of the coaching business. Now, look, some people will say, well, okay, well, if you're going to be a mentor, then yeah, you need that experience because you've got to tell people what they need to do. Mm But if you're a coach, you don't need any of that because you're just you just need to know how to ask great questions so that they can get the answers out of themselves. You don't actually need to know. Mm. Mm, yes and no. Where I disagree with that is that in my personal experience, when I'm coaching, and coaching is the predominant modality that I use, 
when I'm coaching, I'm asking great questions to get the answers out of them, to get them where they need to go. But I need to know where they're going. How can I ask the right questions to get them there? How can I lead if I don't know the destination, Mm -hmm. right? So my 11, 12 years of experience in business before my coaching business gives me the knowledge, experience, and background that I need to be able to have those high-level conversations about any aspect of the business with it, with my clients' businesses. And although like, sometimes I'll tell them, but other times I want them to get there on their own. I want to give them the tools, but I know where they're going, right? So I know what questions to ask so that they can get there on their own. And through going through that process, they now have the tools to curate their thought process, the thought processes to get there so they can replicate that in the future but I still need to know where they're going. Mm-hmm. A great example of this is climbing mountains, right? If I'm going to take a group of people up a mountain, now I might not have been up that mountain before, but I've been up a different mountain. Now, if I've never been up any mountain, that's suicide. How, how do I know how to navigate? How do I know what pitfalls or dangers to look out for? How do I even know what a summit is or how to know when I've got there? Like, there, there's so many... Th- I, how can I get to a destination if I don't know what the destination is or yeah. what, the, what, the, what the route is, what the pathway is? But if I've been up a mountain before, now I, I know what a summit looks like. I know what the pitfalls are. I know what dangers come with hiking out in the mountains. And so I can lead them more effectively up this mountain I've not been up before. So if each business I work with is its own mountain, I've never been up that mountain before. If I work with a new client, that's a new mountain. I've not scaled it before. So yes, there are idiosyncrasies there are differences in that mountain to every other mountain I've climbed but I've climbed other mountains and I know where the summit is and I can do that planning process so that I know what to allow for what gear do we need what's the best route to take how much time do we need to get up and get down safely all of these things I know what the destination is and I've got a rough idea of what needs to be considered in order to get us from A to B Mm -hmm. so yes it's a new mountain yes it's a new business but because I've been there before I've got that, ex- that prerequisite experience to lead. I, ju- I just don't understand. I mean, look, if you're taking someone from startup to five figures, yes, you can get some results. Like if you've been taught well, and done a good course with a good franchise and you've got the right support, you can absolutely help. I'm not saying that business coaches who fall into that category are a complete waste of space and, and should just all quit their day jobs. What I'm saying is that they can only go so far. And when, you know, I, I, I predominantly work with six figure businesses and help them get to seven figures. And I believe that at that level, you really do, I, you need to have an idea of what seven figures looks like. Mm-hmm. I, I've never climbed that mountain that you're climbing right now. We're, we're going to do this together, but I've navigated mountains before and I know what to expect. In getting from six to seven, there's so many different things to consider. If you've never done that, if you've never worked in a seven figure business, how the hell can you navigate that path I, I having been there I don't see how you can like there's conversations that I've had with coaching clients where I've been in direct contradiction to advice that their accountants given them mm-hmm. right now if you're a business coach who's not had that same level of business experience outside of your your coaching business where you've never been at that seven figure level you can't have that, you know, if like, accountants qualified, educated, professional, like you don't disagree with someone who's qualified, educated and professional because they're credible, right? But I know, like, I know from my own experience in dealing with these things that in that particular instance, the accountant was not correct. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in that business, it wasn't so much of an issue, but it, it still needed to be highlighted because it was a consideration for the availability of funding in the future. Obviously, I've got to be careful. I don't go into too many details. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's because of my business experience in a seven-figure business that I was able to say, actually, no, your accountant is wrong. This is the way it is. I no need to have an argument with them or disagree with them. But I'm telling you as your advisor, in my experience, we've been here, we've done this, and this is what happened to us. And that is the danger of what may happen to you if this happens again next year. Like, I don't care what the accountant says and I don't care how qualified they are because I've lived it. I know because I've been there and I've done it. Mm-hmm. And that for me is super powerful. You know, whether, you know, you, you look at people like life coaches, again, you've got 20, 
21 year old who's trained up to be a life coach that's great and and I commend them for putting in the work to do that can they help people yeah of course they can but a life coach at 21 you've not lived now if they're a life coach to 15 year olds or you know teenagers in school and they're helping them prepare for college or what they you know helping them decide who they're going to be and how they're going to move on to the next phase of the yeah, 100% like you've been there you've done it you've walked that path go for it but for a 21 year old to coach me at 33 on what I'm going through right now like you've not walked that fucking path mate um you know I've got six kids I've had a, had multiple businesses I've been up I've been down I've been through tons of stuff that I, you've got no idea about mm -hmm. Yes, you can ask me some questions and I'm a very coachable person, which is why I've had great results in working with my own coaches and mentors. But you're not going to be able to achieve what I can achieve in terms of having that coaching conversation because I've been there. Mm -hmm. Like having kids, I've, I've got a few of them. So I know what I'm talking about when it comes to kids. Someone who's not had kids, how can they coach someone who's a parent? Because there's a whole part of their lives that they have no concept of like they can imagine and they can learn and they can speak to people and get their experiences but like there's an element of this like reading books and watching videos can only take you so far when you experience something you feel it that's the difference i felt what it's like to be down at the lowest point as a parent i felt what it's like to be up here i know how rewarding that is and i know how tough that is mm -hmm. Not, I've not read it in a book. Yeah, you can get an idea and you can understand logically mm -hmm. that that's difficult or that's great. But until you've actually felt it, you don't know what it feels like. It's not the same kind of knowledge. There is the knowledge that is only the intellectual. It's, yeah. you know, that example <clears throat> that you can read about driving, you can read everything there is about driving, but you can't really know what driving is before you actually step behind the wheel. That's it. You can have all the knowledge you want, but you don't know how it feels to be driving. Or flying a plane. Yeah. You can, get, like, you can read all the books about flying airplanes. You can speak to a hundred different pilots. You can like do all the research yeah. that is possible to be done. I'm still not getting in that plane with you. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Though? Like, <laughs> until you've had that, yeah, I, I can actually fly. I've done it before. All right, okay, sound. Now, now we'll go for a flight together. Like, if you're saying to me, uh, oh, yeah, I've read all the books and I've spoken to 100 pilots. I've never flown a plane before, but I, 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 I think I know that. enough. Let's, let's go for a test flight. Hell no, son. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing I wanted to ask you about business is the new era that we're in the, in the 21st century with the internet with the technology with the massive reach that we now have with uh, social media which is obviously a, a business environment is very different than it was let's say 20 or 50 years ago uh, I think you called it the entrepreneur revolution so I, I think that was uh, one of your podcasts uh, yeah and I think you, I, I wrote a blog on that as well okay. but there was definitely a podcast around it and uh, I can't take credit for the phrase entrepreneur revolution that comes from Daniel Priestley his book of that name mm -hmm. and, and a book that I thought was really really spot on in terms of what it was talking about and I think the biggest thing for me is well there's a few points but mainly that when you look at technology and how technology is progressing and evolving it's doing so at an exponential rate and you know we're seeing now self-driving cars soon to be self-driving trucks we've got self-service checkouts now in mcdonald's in supermarkets like jobs are disappearing mm -hmm. because machines are taking over yes like this this isn't terminator 2 but literally not yet not, not yet <laughs> But you know, you look even even that. You look at AI developments and these robots that they're producing now. They're they're scary close, scary scary close. So you have to ask yourself when you look at all of the jobs that exist and how many people are employed in um, what might be described as uh, menial, labor intensive um, jobs like you know stacking shelves, operating kiosks, checkouts, um, driving lorries around, delivering goods. Those jobs aren't going to exist. That's a shit ton of jobs. Right? That's a lot of jobs. Even in the UK alone, there's around 40,000 
um, driving jobs in terms of HGV, so driving you know driving goods around. They that's forty thousand jobs in that one industry alone that are going to disappear overnight as soon as the the self driving truck becomes a tried and tested method of of doing business. Mm. So when you look at that in terms of you know there aren't be any, uh, there aren't going to be any human shelf stackers there aren't going to be any human kiosk operators there aren't going to be any human taxi drivers or delivery drivers you know you can you can look at multiple different industries and look at how technology is very quickly and relatively soon going to completely decimate the jobs market in those areas so that being the case i think it's really important that we take a, a really honest look at our education system and what we're doing to set up our kids, our younger generations now, for that change. And my argument is that actually we're doing a pretty piss poor job because the education system as it stands is is better than it was and there have definitely been improvements made. You know, one of the things I love to do is, is talk in schools um, because I think it's really important to get that real world, world perspective over to these young people. Um, and, you know, there are leadership colleges that do a, a better job than, than some other schools. But there's still a big divide between, I feel, where they should be and where they are. And very much so, the, the models that are predicated around the schooling system and education are still very much based in the Industrial Revolution in terms of let's cookie-cutter get these kids ready for a 9-to-5 in an office or a 12-hour shift in a factory. Yes. Um and and that ain't the world we live in. Like those office jobs, like more and more stuff's being done by computers now than ever. More and more things are being built by machines than ever. Those jobs simply don't exist and won't exist in the future, in the very near future. So we have to take a good, serious, honest look at the way that we're educating our children and the messages we're sending out and the preparation that we're um, we're helping them with as they get ready to go out into the world and, and say, well. How how is the world going to look when they approach it? You know, when when, when they leave the system, when mm-hmm. they get out there and they're expected to produce, what's that world going to look like? You know, you look at I look at my kids, um, all relatively young. When the eldest gets out into the real world, he's going to be somewhere between eighteen and twenty four. That's going to be in around four to ten years time. Mm-hmm. The world is going to be a very different place then. So what's he going to do? How is he going to make a living? Not only make a living, not only survive, but thrive. Mm -hmm. And it isn't going to be going after a a factory job or an office job that is on its way out. Because even if they get one, they're not going to keep it for very long. Because why would you pay a person to do a job you can have a machine do for free? It it just doesn't make business sense. As much as you might hate the model and hate the idea, at the end of the day... It's the world we live in and we can't do anything about that. It's business. Mm -hmm. You're in business to make a profit by doing something, hopefully, that creates a meaningful shift in the world, right? Yes. Solves a problem for somebody. Um, So I feel, uh, and this comes from, from Daniel Priestley's summation of the book by the same name, The Entrepreneur Revolution, I feel that actually... We need to be setting our kids up for more creative pursuits. I feel like we actually need and are going to have more entrepreneurs, more business owners in the next 10, 20 years than we have ever had before. And I think we're already seeing that borne out. You know, A lot of people are self-employed. A lot of people have started their own small business or as a sole trader. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more and more of that. And I actually believe that the kids of today who are not set up for that are going to struggle. They're really going to struggle. Like my kids, they're going to start building their personal brand ASAP. You know, as soon as I feel they're ready for social media, they'll be on there. They'll have website domains registered for them. I'll be talking to them about business. I'll be teaching them how to invest their money, how to trade, how to, you know, looking at things like cryptocurrencies and stocks and shares and Forex and all that stuff. And from a very young age, they are going to start setting the building blocks in place to set their lives up so that they have options. But I'm doing that because that's the journey I've been through. Like I look back to when I was 20, and if I had known at 20 what I know now, today I would be sat here a multi-multi-millionaire. No question in my mind. 
for, for the one simple reason that if I'd have known then what I know now, I would have bought a fuckload of Bitcoin in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because where I remember when cryptos first started coming to the fore and it made a lot of sense to me. You know, even when I first started, I think I first heard about them on the Joe Rogan experience. Come back to that a lot. Listen mm-hmm, to that shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was interviewing Andreas Antonopoulos a real authority on the subject and I understood it. I just got it. You know, from the first moment I heard about it, it was like, this is the future. This mm-hmm. makes sense. That was years before I ever invested. You can imagine how much I'm kicking myself. I can imagine. Yeah. But if I, I mean, the, the, the barrier to entry then was so much higher, you know, not so much in terms of cost, but in terms of the mechanics of the how, 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 yeah, how yeah. to actually get hold of the damn Absolutely. stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that was the one thing that helped me, but I just didn't, didn't really know how, how to do it. Um, so simply, like if I'd have known everything I know today and been more educated at that point on in trading and investing and all that kind of stuff, I would have just sunk a shitload of money into, into Bitcoin. Um, and that would be worth a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot of money today. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the things I'm very passionate about I've mentioned it briefly already around my own kids, but generally speaking, the younger generations, I don't want to fail them. Uh, and I think I look at the the education systems and I look at the way the world's set up and, and, and I see it failing those kids. And that breaks my heart because that means it's going to fail my kids. And for me, it's really important to be able to like the podcast, going out and doing talks. Like that's a big part of giving back for me. And it's a big part for me of how I'm, doing my bit to help set these kids up for success in later life, help them to have the tools and the mindset that they need to be really successful. And so in terms of how the business landscape is is changing, I think that's a really major thing to consider as we look to the future and what that means for our children. Um, But in terms of business as a whole, yeah, it's, it's, it's completely different. You know, even for established businesses now, you know, you've got Facebook, Facebook Live, you've got LinkedIn Live now has, has now been launched. We've got now businesses who have their own apps. You know, I have my own app, the Bulletproof app, uh, which is complete a complete game changer for, for me and my business. It allows me to serve my clients at a much higher level. Um, it allows me to get my content out to the people who need it and to the people who want it by cutting through all the noise. It allows me to curate all of the tools that I've created and put them in a forum, put them in a place where people can actually get them and there's a low barrier to entry. And so technology is really changing the way that we do business. And I think more now it's uh, Will Will Polston, the the founder and, and host of the Evolve Network where I was speaking last night, he said something that was really profound and that was, we should just get rid of this term networking because it doesn't mean anything. What we should call it is relationship building. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that. I think that's so insightful. Um, and more and more today, it is about that relationship building, but it's about solving problems. Now, for a business to be successful, it's got to solve a problem. It's got to, it's got to satisfy a want or a need, right? But I think there's a much harsher focus now on entrepreneurship and business owners in terms of how are they contributing to the world? Mm -hmm. What are their values? What are Mm -hmm. their morals and ethics? Mm -hmm. How are they not just solving problems, but solving meaningful problems in a meaningful way? And that really is where I see the focus shifting more and more towards really more society focused, more culture focused businesses that are looking at what do we need to do to progress as a race? What problems are we facing right now that are holding us back? Yeah, there's always going to be leisure and going and doing cool stuff just for the sake of it, jumping out of planes and you know all this crazy stuff. Um, but more and more, the focus is, and, and for us as consumers as well, we're looking for connection. Mm-hmm. And this is the counterintuitive thing, right? Is we live in a world where we're more connected than we've ever been yet we're less connected than we've ever been. You know, we have these social media platforms where I can take up my phone, effectively a supercomputer that fits in my pocket. And my my podcast, I've interviewed people in the States. I've interviewed people live from India. Mm-hmm. You know, like 
wow, yeah. wow, I can reach out and touch people thousands of miles away and I can bring that to people here. And like I said earlier, my, my show's been listened to and is listened to in 33 plus countries worldwide last time mm-hmm. I checked. Mm-hmm. That's insane and that, that's amazing. Yet when I walk down the streets in my hometown, people look at the floor and don't say hello. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? I know like, what you mean. You know, back yeah. 50 years ago, a, it, a village ro- raised a family. It wasn't just the parents. You know, you'd have the grandparents, you'd have the, the extended family, you'd have the friends and co- and everyone would chip in and help everybody else. And there was this real sense of community. And it's like we've lost a lot of that. And yeah, we've got communities online. We've got Facebook groups. Yeah, and this it's, and, it's not the same. Very superficial. Not, yeah. Very yeah. superficial. And... Um, that shouldn't replace the human connection, the human connection with people to be able to look at somebody in the street you've never seen before in your life and go, hey, what a wonderful day. Mm. To just meet eyes with somebody mm. and smile. Mm. Like everyone looks away. No one wants to look at you. Like that, that, that's why it's so important in business because we've lost so much of that in society. And it's not completely gone. And some places are better than others. Some places are worse than others, of course. But for businesses now, it's so important that we are communicating effectively with our followers, with our fans. And that's not just our clients. And adding value. You've got to add value first. You've got to give. You've got to give. You've got to give. And don't expect anything in return. Just do what you do and do it really well. And care about people. And show that you care. And act in a way that shows that you care. Mm -hmm. And that you'll get traction. People will follow you. People will want to work with you because of your outlook on life, because of the way that you deal with people, because of the way that you want to affect the world, because of your vision. And I think that's more important now than it's ever been. And I think that's only going to continue to get more and more important. In terms of the nuts and bolts of business, like you're now not just advertising in newspapers, magazines, doing leaflet drops. You're doing Facebook ads, you're doing content marketing, you're doing email marketing, you're sending push notifications, you're doing Facebook messenger chat bots and all of this fancy stuff, right? You know, there's so many different ways to connect, but the danger there is that you're trying to do too much. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do everything when really you should just be focused on doing one thing really, really well. Um, So it's, it's easier to connect than it's ever been but so much more confusing because it's like, well, fuck, should I be on LinkedIn? Should I be do on like on Facebook? And like, do I post three times a day or one time a day or once a week or shit? Everyone's talking about podcast. Should I start a podcast? Um, like, Oh, should I do video? Or have I got to do Facebook live or or should I just do blogs? I mean, like there's so many different ways and it's very easy to get overwhelmed. overwhelmed the, yeah. the truth of the matter is, look, if you're Gary V, then yeah, you should be doing stuff on every single platform, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, all of that stuff, right? But most of us aren't Gary V. And this is the thing is you have to implement a strategy that's appropriate for where you are. And this is a big part of what I'm doing with clients when I work with them on my accelerators is looking at well, where are you are, where are you today? What's the next logical step to get you to the bigger outcome? What are those process goals? And what's the best way for us to focus on one thing that's going to get us to that process goal? A lot of it's about strategy and cutting out a lot of the noise and focusing on the one thing that's going to get you results. And it's really difficult for people sometimes um, to cut through the noise because you, you feel like you should be doing everything. Yeah. If you're not doing everything, you're not doing enough because Gary Vee's doing everything and he's putting out like 60 posts a day. Grant Cardone's doing like 20 tweets a day. But these guys have whole social media teams. Like That's not actually Grant Cardone and Gary Vee putting that shit out, right? They're doing their long form content and then their team is taking that, splitting it up and doing quotes and doing this and doing that and just amplifying the hell out of it. Yes. Like You have to see it for what it is. Uh, if you look at Rob Moore and go, oh, Rob Moore's everywhere. He's doing lives every day and he's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing that. Oh, well, that's what I've got to do to be successful. No, Rob Moore is an eight-figure multi-business owner, right? He's got a whole team of people behind him Mm -hmm. curating and pushing this stuff. You don't have that and you you don't have the budget for that. If you're a startup, if you're a five-figure, even a low six-figure business owner, you don't need all that stuff. 
Like just identify where are your clients, ideal clients hanging out? Who are they? Like get to know them. You've got to get to know your clients. Figure out who they are. What do they love? What makes them tick? Where do they hang out? And just go there. Go there and give them what they need. Talk in their language. Remove yourself from your own biases and understand the people who you're trying to connect with. Again, it just all comes back to this connection. More and more so now, life in every respect, business included, is more, it's more about connection. If you want to be successful, you've got to connect. Thanks. Jamie, in terms of um, mistakes in business, And I'm not going to ask you necessarily about your mistakes, even though I would love to live Mate, to hear about... Mate, we've been here all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but tell me, what are the most common mistakes that uh, business should easily avoid, but because they don't know about it, they, they do it? And I want to ask in two different scenarios. One is on a startup mm-hmm. and one is on a business that wants to scale. Just let's okay. th- let's just say one uh, example or okay. the main one. Yeah. So um, startups and um, very smaller businesses, so sole traders, uh, five-figure businesses, the biggest mistake they're making is they're just doing too much stuff. They're, they're trying, like they're looking at all these bigger businesses and the influencers, and they're doing exactly what I've just talked about. They think oh, I've got to be on every platform. I've got to be doing content marketing. I need to be doing email marketing. And they're getting burnt out and overwhelmed because they just can't. Because like I said, they don't have the budget for the media team that sits behind some of those big influencers. Um, But equally in terms of lots of different products, lots of different service offerings, rather than just saying, right, you know what? Like for my business, I've got one program, one product. It's business consulting and it's the Bulletproof Business Accelerator. Mm -hmm. Now that has two different levels right now, but it's one product. It's, it's not this or this or this or this or this, because that just creates confusion in the buying process. It's like, whoa, which one do I choose? It's like, I know where my strengths are. I'm focusing my product on that. So there's no, you know what I'm about. It's about structuring the business with the right systems so that you can scale and exit if you want to. Sure. That's what it's all about. Grow without making all the mistakes we did. Because mm-hmm. revenue, for the sake of revenue, is vanity. If you're making revenue, like we did four and a half million and made no money. We made more money in two million. What's the point? All the stress, all the hassle, all that extra work, all the long days, all the, the sleepless nights were for nothing. Because we didn't actually make any fucking money, <laughs> right? So it's, it's about being effective. What do I need to be? Get focused on your outcome. Like They want to make some money. But if you're focused on the money, then you're focused on the wrong things. You need to be focused on serving. You need to be focused on the problem that you solve and producing and delivering a solution that's going to solve it to the highest degree. Because if you do that, the money will come. You don't have to focus on that. Focus on your strengths. And it's about getting really clear on what those strengths are like what are you particularly in in the coaching and consulting space like what are you really good at what is your thing because you can say oh I'm, i'm a business coach yeah i'll help you with your marketing strategy yeah let, let's work on sales yeah we'll do a bit of ops do yes yeah, systems okay oh leadership yeah we'll do that too too jack, much jack yeah. jack of all trades master yeah. of none who connects with that mm-hmm. like if i'm going to go if i want something doing Or if I need education on something, I'm not going to a jack of all trades. Like, who has done that one thing really, really well? Who is the master of that one? Who's the best in the business? Yes. You know, if I want to learn skiing, I'm going to go to the best skiing instructor that's done the most skiing with the most accolades and the most accomplishments that my money can afford. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, why would you? Rather than someone who, yeah, I'm all right at skiing. I can do skiing, snowboarding, skateboarding, roller skating. But, well, no, I'm, I'm not interested. I want to ski. I want to be the best at skiing. That's what your clients want. That's what the people in the world want. If they've got a problem, then it's like, right, well, I just want that problem solved. And I'm going to go with someone who's an expert at that mm-hmm. over someone who can do all of this in a, in a mediocre kind of way. Yeah, it's like... <clears throat> 
<clears throat> super super niching it down to very very specific uh, problems. So we'll just get clear on what you're good at. Uh-huh. Like no one is amazing at everything. Like I'm sure. I'm really good at taekwondo. Okay, I've trained in sistema and MMA, and MMA consists of Brazilian jiu jitsu, Muay Thai, um, and wrestling. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm shit at two of those. Okay. <laughs> the Brazilian jiu jitsu, like when we used to do sparring in MMA. The guys would just take me to the ground and kick my ass and strangle the fuck out of me. Because that's not my... Like, can I do it? Could could I take you to the ground and strangle you? Yeah, I could. But I, I don't go out there saying, I'm a, I'm a multi-martial, I can do you know, like all of this different stuff. No, I'm, I'm Taekwondo. That's my thing. Mm-hmm. Can I do a bit of BJJ and a bit of Muay Thai and a bit of... Re- yeah, I can. A little bit. But I'm, I'm not... Like, I, don't, I can't... Like, I'm not a master at any of that. I've done it, I've dabbled in it, but my thing is Taekwondo. So get really clear on what your thing is. With business, like my experience in business is not sales, is not marketing, it's operations, operations, it's structure. How do we structure a business to deliver as efficiently and as effectively as possible? What mm-hmm. systems do we need? Mm-hmm. What processes do we need to get the best results? How do we manage our people? What are the key KPIs that we need to assign to each role so that they are clear on what success and failure looks like. But moreover than that, so that you're clear on what success and failure looks like in those roles. Because if you don't know that, how can you manage those people? So that's my area of expertise. Now, do we talk when I work with my clients about sales strategy, marketing? Yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. But I don't go out and talk about that in my marketing. When I'm doing content, I'm not talking about Sales. I'm not talking about marketing. I'm talking about how to structure a business, how to set KPIs. You know, what systems do you need to get the best results in this particular field or department? I talk about what I'm good at, mm-hmm. and where my strengths are, mm-hmm. and I'm clear on what that is. Mm-hmm. A big mistake that people made, I've said, is just like trying to. I, they think that oh, if, if I say I'm good at everything, like life coaches. I'm going to coach on your life, mate. Which bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's so diverse, life. There's yeah. so many different faucets and aspects yeah. to it. Which bit are you an expert at? Because you can't be an expert at everything. Relationships, wealth, business, health, fitness, nutrition. Mm-hmm. You can't. There's not enough hours in the day. There's people who dedicate their whole lives to just one of those. And yes, they're experts, but they still don't know it all. So get clear on where your strengths are, I'd say, as particularly at startup and like know who you are and know your client. Mm-hmm. Know what the problem is. Like business is simple, okay? Find a problem, identify a problem in the world, develop a solution that solves that problem, and then go and sell that to the people who need it. Like in a nutshell, that's business. And it sounds fucking simple. And it is, and people mm-hmm. overcomplicate it, mm-hmm. particularly at startup level. Like that's it, three steps. Now, where I focus is the stuff that sits behind that, mm-hmm. is the infrastructure that supports those activities. Well, how do I identify that problem? And how do I continually assess my identification of that to make sure I stay ahead of the game and on point? How do I develop a service that solves the problem? How do I deliver it? How do I deliver it profitably? And how do I deliver it to the right people? How do I find the right people? What's my marketing strategy? How do I retain them? How, what systems do I use to maintain outstanding customer service so they come back again and again and again, which pushes up the lifetime value of the client? That like That's all the complicated stuff. But in essence, it's three simple steps to a successful business. It's the infrastructure that sits behind that causes people a lot of problems. So to answer your second question, mm-hmm. the thing that most businesses struggle with when they are at a bigger level, so six figures and above, is the infrastructure. Okay. It's the bits that sit behind. Mm-hmm. Because you've got people who start businesses because they want more autonomy, they want more freedom, uh, they want to be their own boss. They feel like they can do a better job than their previous company was doing if they go out and do it themselves. So they're really good at their trade. Um, my background is obviously in construction, and a lot of construction business owners started out as tradesmen. right? So you might have... A, a joiner who starts a building business, a construction business. Well, he's really good at making stuff with his hands, mm-hmm. or she is. Um, they can create these beautiful stairways and um, counters and bars and, and all this wonderful stuff. 
hasn't got a fucking clue about business. No education around it. Never done a business course. It's just like, right, well, I need to make some, I need to make money. I'm better off doing this on my own. So I'll just kind of figure it out. And up to five figures, that's okay. You know, you can figure, is it worth having a coach or mentor? Absolutely. Now, whether that's someone that you pay for or whether that's someone that's already in business who you know is a friend who can give you advice on the hot, yes. <laughs> or whether that's you just find someone who you really resonate with online, you can't afford their services, but you just consume everything that they do, their books, their videos, their content, everything. Um, so yeah, find a mentor. But for the most part, you can muddle through and figure that stuff out on your own. And at that level, you haven't got other people in the business who are relying on you for direction. Okay, so it's, it's all you and it's all up in your head and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But when you get to six figures and beyond, now you're looking at bringing other people into the business to help. Even when you start with just your virtual assistant in the Philippines or whatever, everybody talks about this. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I'll get myself a VA. She's going to cost me $3 an hour in the Philippines and she can work for me for you know 40 hours a week for a month and it costs me 200 quid or whatever. It's a bargain. Okay. You still need to be able to hire that person in the right way. So you've picked the right person. And how do you manage that person? That's actually, for me, I would say that's more difficult than managing someone who's sat on a desk in front of you. Because you're now not only dealing with distance, you're dealing with cultural barriers. You're dealing with language barriers. So, yeah, you might get some really cheap labor, but how effective is it going to be? Well, the key to that is the systems that sit behind it. Mm -hmm. It's about pulling the information out of your head, which you've relied on up to this point because it's just been you and that's been okay. But now there's other people who need that, and it's up here. But because you've always just done it, you've never really thought through, oh, how do I do that? What is my process? Because you just, do you know what I mean? Like, you just do it. You don't think, like, what's the step by step? And so the biggest mistake that people make is they will continue to try and operate in that way at six and seven figures and beyond. And that is a recipe for disaster because all that's going to happen is you're going to run yourself into the ground. You're going to end up micromanaging your staff, which is going to piss people off and create a horrible culture in the business. And that in it, in itself is going to create mistakes, failures, fuck ups. People are going to drop the ball. People are going to feel disenfranchised. You're going to have high staff turnover. So The biggest challenge there for those business owners is at six figures, you need to be really thinking hard about giving me a call and talking about how we can get that stuff out of your head Mm -hmm. and into some meaningful systems and processes so that you can take your business to the next level without driving yourself into the ground. Because if that all relies on you disseminating what's in your head, what you have to remember as well is everybody in your business, like they're unique human beings. Okay, so I can explain the same thing from my head to 10 people and they'll all interpret that slightly differently. Now, equally, as business owners, we're human beings too and we're not infallible. We forget stuff. We explain it different. And and this was a big problem in my previous business whereby we had multiple directors. Yeah, there weren't the systems in place. Mm -hmm. So a member of staff would go and speak to me and I'd say, right, do X, Y and Z. But then they'd bump into another director and they'd say, no, don't fucking do that. Go and do this. Or just don't do anything. Yes. Leave it to me. And then another director says, but why haven't you done it? And now this employee is like, fuck's sake, man. Like, <laughs> what am I doing here? Like, the, the, the disharmony that creates is super, super... And I've lived through this, yeah. so I can speak from first hand. Um, You've, you've got to get it down in black and white. And that was one of the most powerful things that we did. And one of the most powerful things I do with my clients is getting that stuff down so it's tangible. Because even then when you've got multiple directors on a board or with different ideas, there is a an SOP. There's a standard operating procedure, right? That is like, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. Let's get opinions out of the, out of the room here for a minute. This is what we've agreed is the most effective way to get the end result that we want. Mm-hmm. And that's repeatable and replicable you give that to a member of staff say right there it is that's how i want you to work is it rigid have you got suggestions like no it's not rigid if you've got suggestions if you think like you're on the front line i don't want to micromanage you and i need to trust you to get this done because i'm not building a business where i'm going to do all of this different stuff for you and micromanage because that's not a business that's a really stressful job you're giving yourself the whole point of building a business is to Create a profitable enterprise that can run without you. Yes. So you build it, you systemize it, and then you pop in for a board meeting once a month. Or you just sell the thing. 
you know, that, that's what an entrepreneur does. Um, if you want to build a business and give yourself a job, crack on. Yeah. That's not what I'm about, though. I don't want to build a business that is just going to in, in make me work 12 hours a day, seven days a week for the next 40 years. That's that's not me having a business. I've just created a vehicle to give myself another job. Yeah. But this time, I'm working for a boss that expects more of me than anybody else ever will, working longer hours than I've ever worked before and earning less than I've ever earned. That's, that's the position that a lot of people find themselves in. And even at six and seven figure levels, you still see the same phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And it's because the business isn't systemized. And you look at systems and, and that word is like, it's not sexy, is it? Like, you talk, oh yeah, let's systemize the business, baby. <laughs> like, it, it's just not getting you aroused, is it? You know? So. But it, but it is super important. You know, the, the result that that produces, that gets me aroused because that, that's super cool. Because as entrepreneurs, we want to create an impact, right? Now, we can do that with a business. We can do even more with five businesses, 10 businesses, 20 businesses. So the more businesses that we can create and automate and step away from, the more impact we can have in multiple different areas in the world. So it's absolutely key, both from a personal health point of view and also from your ability to actually be able to achieve the things that you want financially um, in terms of your own life, but also in terms of how much stuff you've got going on. It's all about leverage. How can you leverage as many different, as many people and as many systems and resources as possible to do good in the world? Mm-hmm. Um, and systems are the answer. So that's probably the biggest thing for six and seven figure business owners. I was speaking to a guy the other day. He's got a seven hundred thousand pound business, and he's just he's running around doing everything himself. He's got like twenty, thirty people out on site, and no systemization. Like he's run ragged, working sixteen hours a day, working every hour that God send, catching up on stuff at the weekend. That's not a fucking life, man. No. Like, what about your friends, your family? What about going out and seeing the world? What experiences do you want? Like just grinding it out for 12 hours a day and going on the odd holiday to escape from that shit life once a year or twice a year, that's not a life, at least not in my book. It might be for you and you might think that that's, that's A-OK. And that's the mindset of you know the previous generations. And my mm-hmm. parents and beyond is like, right, well, you go and get a job and you just grind out for 40 years. No, thank you. And this comes back to our conversation earlier about the entrepreneur revolution. That is not the mindset anymore. The the whole landscape of employment has changed. People don't just want a job. They don't want to just go and get a secure job for the next 40 years that's going to pay them a wage so that they can live their life in their own time because we don't have any of our own time anymore. You know, we've, we, we don't just work nine to five. Even those people who've got a nine to five, they've got their emails on their fucking phone. They're getting phone calls from the boss at the weekend. Like, when do you switch off? That, like, if you added up the hours that those people actually do, I bet they would be below the minimum wage. If you were truly like how much time they spend in the mornings and evenings dealing with emails, phone calls, thinking about the job, what they're going to do the next day, I'm like that's all legitimate working time, and it's just not accounted for. Um, so yeah, it's super super important. Thank you very much, Jamie. This is uh, an extremely comprehensive <laughs> answer. Um, I'm going to start wrapping it up a little bit, all right? Cool, and, yeah. And uh, I have a couple of quick fire questions, cool. which I, I'm going to take the subject away from business. Now, going back into personal development, which is the podcast <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so let's say you had the ability to run into your teenage self and have a chat with them, teach them something that potentially could change the, their life. What would that be? Keep learning. Mm-hmm. Education doesn't stop when you leave school. Mm-hmm. That, that was the biggest mistake I made as a teenager was I hated education. I did well. I was quite naturally academic. Um, but when I left when I left college, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go and be a rock star. And I, I legitimately left, dropped out of college. I did the whole of the first year and didn't even bother sitting the AS exams. Mm-hmm. I dropped out a few weeks before. Because I just come to the conclusion that I wasn't going to college. I didn't need a bunch of UCAS points. So what was the point in putting myself through the stress of the exams? I just go and focus on my music career and work at Pizza Hut. Like that's the life, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I stopped learning, right? So I didn't discover personal development until I was 25, 26 years old. First personal development book I bought was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And um, interestingly, I only just read that book. Yeah, I was about to say it's not the easiest book to start with. There are much more easily digestible books to start your journey well, than but, that. But a great book. It but, is, it but is. It's, it's a fundamental. It was yeah. the first step for me, it, not reading it, but just buying it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I bought that in 2013 and only just this year have read that book. Um, so it would be... look. I would be, I had a real stigma around personal development and self-help. I thought, oh, it's only weak people who need that. Okay, that's interesting. And I I think there's a lot of people out there in the world who do hold that same stigma. Um, I was almost feeling like, well, if you need a self-help book, you're you're less of a person, like just figure it out kind of thing. And really naive point of view. So my, my main message to myself would be, listen, go and buy Think and Grow Rich. Go and buy... Rich Dad, Poor Dad, go and buy Code of the Extraordinary Mind. Like I, I would just give myself a list of books and say, like, I'm, I've traveled back from the future, so this is some real shit and you need to pay attention to me. You need to go and read these books and you need to do it now and never stop reading, never stop progressing. Never, like, you have no idea how much potential you have and you are sleeping through your life. Wake the fuck up. And then I'll probably kick myself in the face or something just for added effect. <laughs> it's uh, those books you mentioned. Uh, funnily enough, uh, Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People. If yeah. I if I could go back, I would uh, force my teenage self to read those books straight away. Uh, as I will be yeah. forcing my kids to read them as well. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Jamie, let's say you had a magic wand and you could uh, change something in the world as it is today, instantly. What would that be? Oh, a great question. I think you have to be very careful when considering questions like that because it's very difficult to appreciate and understand the ripple effect of even changing one small thing and how that could potentially affect other things. Like there are um, instances where we've introduced certain animals into countries. Australia is a great example to deal with other animals, which we consider to be pests and causing a problem. When we've done that, actually the animals we've introduced themselves become pests and other animals come to the fore and mm-hmm. become more prominent because the other pest we've got rid of is now not there to control them. And it's this whole ecosystem that we had no idea how everything kind of tied in together and fed each other. I think if I could wave a magic wand and give everybody a gift, it would be when having conversations and when listening to points of view, when communicating, to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. I think that's probably one of the most important things that we can do as human beings. The way I I say to my clients and some of the work that I do is working with their their employees, their team, um, hosting staff meetings and, and group trainings and stuff like that. And one of the things I say to them is, look, you're all, you know, you have these gripes and these issues and you're all talking about this stuff all you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to make me or trying to make the, the leader, the, the boss, the owner, understand you, right? What are you doing to understand them? If we're all sat around a table and we're all trying to make our point understood, mm-hmm. so I, I'm trying to be understood by everybody, you're trying to be understood by Who's going to be understood? No one. No one. No one. Now... If we flip that and say now everybody around that table, yeah, we have our own viewpoints, but our primary goal is to understand everybody else. Now everybody gets understood. And when everybody's understood, then we can objectively look at all of the different data that's on the table and we can make better decisions Mm -hmm. because we're looking at everything and we understand everything. Mm -hmm. And when we understand everything, then we can make 
quality educated decisions. So whether it's in business, whether it's in life, whether it's in your relationships, you've like the biggest thing that lets people down, myself included, is we 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 lead with wanting to be understood. And I get it. Like we all want to be understood. It's human nature, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. But it's it's imperative we lead with understanding first. Thank you. Uh, tell me how can people connect with you? How can they find out more? And uh, of All course, I'll of put ways. everything on the the show notes. But uh, please let us know. Cool. So look, the the best way you can connect with me is to download my app, Bulletproof Business. Um, look, and yes, it's a, an app specifically with business content. But a big part of business for me is personal development. Your business can only grow as much as you grow. Mm-hmm. Like if your growth has stopped. You, you can only take a business or any venture, any project to a certain level. The way to keep growing is for you to keep growing as a leader. Yes. Uh, so personal development is a massive part of any successful business, both for the leader and for the employees. You know, the, the training and development that you invest in for your staff is key. Um, so the, basically, go to the App Store. Um, if you're a filthy Android user, you can even get it too by going to the Play Store Um, just type in Bulletproof and you're looking for a black box with a bullet hole in it and a big B. If you download that app, you can connect with me on there. You can message me directly. You can get all of my best content because there's stuff on there that is, that, that's the only place it goes. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where everything is. Um, and you're going to get access on there to a lot of the cool features. Now, the first thousand people that come into the app, I've got a very special gift for And particularly if you're a business owner, but even if you're not, you know, there are features and tools within this that are coming out over the next couple of months, which are going to be massive for you in terms of staying accountable and getting great results. The first thousand people who come into the app as beta testers right now are going to get level two access to all of that stuff. Mm. Now, a lot of those tools and a lot of those resources later on once they're developed and tested are only going to be available to certain levels of my paying clientele. My gift to you is, as a thank you for helping me test it and helping me and helping to support it, is the first thousand people who get in there, you're going to have instant access to all of that stuff. So that, yeah, you can help me test it, but it's like, trust me, those tools are going to be so powerful. There's inbuilt accountability modules. There's tools and calculators to work out how you how much you should pay yourself through PAYE or through dividends. Um, I cash flow projections, like so many tools for business. And there's even an inspiration section where you can like wake up in the morning and you can get all of my favorite inspirational quotes and just flick through them. Like it's just gonna, it just gives you everything that you need. Um, and if you want to speak to me, if you want to connect with me, the best thing to do is to jump on there and just pop me a message or pop a post on the app. But you can also connect with me. Look, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, just search at the Jamie Keeling and you'll find me. Um, You'll know it's me because I'm either in a, a head in a, with a mohawk in a red floating <laughs> circle, or I'm laying back all casual in a in another circle. Um, so I'm I'm quite easy to find. But I, look, I do a lot of stuff on Facebook and LinkedIn and stuff. They're my two primary platforms. Instagram as well. Um, and if you want to pop me an email, you can do that too. I'm a very friendly guy. I don't usually bite, although I do swear quite a bit. You don't bite, but you like to kick people on the, on the I, head. I, I, I do, I do. Yeah, I must admit, I do. I do appreciate a good kick to the face. Uh, you have to be wearing gear though. So as long as you're not approaching me wearing a dobok, you're generally going to be okay. Uh, but yeah, you pop me an email, Jamie at optimizemenow.com. Um, I love connecting with people, you know. Um, and and if anything I've talked about on this podcast today resonates with you from a personal development point of view, and you just want to ask a question or even from a business point of view and you'd like to find out more about how I work with clients and how we scale from six to seven figures then like I say connect with me on the app drop me an email mm-hmm. pop me a message on Facebook I just connect it's great Jamie thank you very much for being on uh, Personal Development Essentials Podcast today uh, I will say with certainty that it was worth the wait of, <laughs> until we managed to meet in person because I didn't want to do this interview uh, online. I wanted to, to be face to face with you and it was really worth it. Um, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much once again for being here and uh, I wish you all the best with your endeavors and uh, 
with raising your family. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Jamie. I, I, it's been a real pleasure. Um, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I love the work that you do. I think you're a phenomenal human being. It's a real honour to come on here and talk to you today. Likewise, Steve. And, and I think we've uh, we've discussed a lot and, and hopefully your audience can take a lot away from it. And if anyone's interested in, in coming over and listening to my show, Optimise Me Now, it's on iTunes and Stitcher. So just... Just give it a search and uh, we'd love to welcome you to, as listeners on that show as well. But listen, I, I think this this podcast and you and what you're doing for the world is great. Keep up the good work and it's a real honour to be invited down here to be a part of it. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate it on Apple Podcasts and also share this episode with someone who you think will benefit from it. If you want to find out more about what I do and gain access to exclusive content, join my Facebook group Personal Development Mastery. The link is in the show notes or you can simply type bit.ly slash pdm group. And until next time, stand out, don't fit in, 